Is 
if you would be seated at this time. We're going to uh, take up an offering. I'm just going to ask the Lord to bless it. Father, we thank you for the abundance that you give to us. The gifts that you give to us and the things that you give to us. All good things come from you and we want to bless you this morning. Bless those who give abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. I greet you this morning in the precious name of Jesus, our risen Lord, the one who makes it possible for us to have the hope of eternal life, the one that makes it possible for us to have eternal life, the one who has given everything so that we may receive all in him. I want to just welcome you here this morning, and um, it's, it's interesting, we talk about this quite often at the end of a service or in the aftermath of a service. As ministers, we talk about the people that are coming, the new ones that we didn't get a chance to meet, and um, some of you have maybe been attending several Sundays, and you say, boy, we still haven't met one of the pastors, or maybe you have. We try to have one of us out there, at least in the foyer, to meet you and greet you when you come, but I know there's many of you that I have not spoken with yet, and I hope that that will happen sometime soon, but just know that we do notice you from up here, and we're grateful for your presence, and um, you're welcome to be here. And so we welcome you this morning. A couple weeks ago, I had spoken on the tale of two kings, and I spoke about King Jehoshaphat and his partnership or alliance with King Ahab of Israel. And I shared that I was going to follow up with a message on the legacy of a king, and I want to do that this morning. I want to take a look at the legacy of the king named Jehoshaphat. And as I, as I was talking with Arlen, who um, does a lot of these, Arlen and Heather, I believe, do the backgrounds for these, these sermons, and they have a tough job because they need to take the concept that we're talking about mid, middle of the week and uh, try to put a graphic to it. And I, I told Arlen, I wanted something that looks like I am reflecting. What is following? What is the legacy? If I were on a hike and I turned around to look, and, and some of these things can be just a little bit 
vague as we look into what has happened. Oftentimes, we're not quite sure what our legacy really looks like. It's like I tell people when they, they tell me that their children, they're, they're just so concerned with how their children have turned out, and I say, well, they haven't turned out yet. Um, teenagers haven't turned out yet. 20-somethings haven't turned out yet. And guess what? 51-somethings haven't turned out yet. We're still in the process, right? And so we don't always know what that legacy looks like. It might be a little foggy. It might be, but time is one of those things we say time will tell, and sometimes time does tell as things work out. I've heard it said that if you want to know the convictions of a man or woman, look at the behavior and values of their grandchildren. Now, that's easy for me to say because I don't have grandchildren yet. I'd like to have grandchildren. One day we will, perhaps, but I think there's some truth to that. By the third generation, what was really important has often been sort of sifted through and sifted out. And we see that in the behavior of the grandchildren. But this morning, I want to look at Jehoshaphat's heirs. In fact, heirs, not as in errors. I will look at a few of those but as in his heirs, those who followed him, his son, his grandson, his daughter-in-law, and his great-grandson. And look at the legacy of a king. And along the way, we're going we're gonna to touch on a few subjects that I think are very pertinent to how do we leave a legacy, particularly in the partnerships that we form. So I'm going to read uh, several lengthy passages of Scripture at the beginning to give us a context of the legacy of Jehoshaphat, and then we'll come back and look at the at, at the um, at, at a few other points. So here we go: Second Chronicles 21, 1 through 6, and then we'll skip a section and go down to 12 through 20. But let's begin. And Jehoshaphat rested with his fathers. That means he passed away. He died. I like that, though. He rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. Then Jehoram, his son, reigned in his place. He had brothers, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, Jehiel, Zechariah, Azariahu. Probably didn't say that right. Most times we don't. We just try to make it sound like we're confident. Michael and Shephatiah. All of these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, king of Israel. Their father gave them great gifts of silver and gold and precious things with fortified cities in Judah, but he gave the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. Now, when Jehoram was established over the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and killed all his brothers with the sword and also others of the prince princes of Israel. Not a very nice thing. Not a good start to a legacy. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel. I'm sorry, Jehoram was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. And he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For he had the daughter of Ahab as a wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And a letter came to him from Elijah the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord God of your father David. Now, to be a king and to get a letter from the prophet Elijah is pretty major. Elijah seemed to show up when a king was messing up. And to, get a, to receive a letter from a prophet is pretty profound. And it's really a direct intervention from God in the ways of a king. And Jehoram gets this letter from Elijah the prophet saying, Thus says the Lord God of your father David, because you have not walked in the ways of Jehoshaphat your father or in the ways of Asa king of Judah, but have walked in the way of the kings of Israel and have made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to play the harlot like the harlotry of the house of Ahab and also have killed your brothers, those of your father's household who were better than yourself, behold, the Lord will strike your people with a serious affliction your children and your wives and all your possessions, and you will become very sick with the disease of your intestines and your, until your intestines come out by reason of the sickness day by day. 
Moreover, the Lord stirred up against Jehoram the spirit of the Philistines and the Arabians who were near the Ethiopians. And they came up into Judah and invaded it and carried away all the possessions that were found in the king's house and also his sons and his wives so that there was not a son left to him except Jehoahaz, the youngest of his sons, and unfortunately, Athaliah. Uh, it doesn't say that here, but it took off his other wives, but they left her. I wonder why. So now his brothers and the princes are dead, and the Philistines, Arabians, and Ethiopians have killed all of his sons except his youngest. After all this, verse 18, the Lord struck him in his intestines and with, with an incurable disease. Then it happened in the course of time, and this has got to be gross, after the end of two years that his intestines came out because of his sickness, so he died in a severe pain. I won't even try to speculate where they came out or what was going on, but that sounds discouraging. And his people made no burning for him like the burning for his fathers. He was 32 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years and to no one's sorrow departed. However, they buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. What an epitaph. To no one's sorrow he, de he departed, not even his wife. And then if we read 2 Chronicles 22, I want to pop over here and read a few. Actually, we'll read this entire chapter. It's not very long, but this will give us the picture. Then the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Ahaziah, the same as Jehoahaz, um, made Ahaziah his youngest son king in his place. For the raiders who came from, with the Arabians into the camp had killed all the older sons. So Ahaziah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, reigned. Ahaziah was 42 years old when he became king, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Athaliah, the granddaughter of Omri. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. Therefore he did evil in the sight of the Lord like the house of Ahab, for they were his counselors after the death of his father to his destruction. He also followed their advice and went with Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, to war against Hazael, king of Syria, at Ramoth Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Jehoram, Joram, and he returned to Jezreel to recover from the wounds which he had received at Ramah when he fought against Hazael, king of Syria. And Azariah, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Jehoram, the son of Ahab, in Jezreel because he was sick. His going to Joram was God's occasion for Ahaziah's downfall, for when he arrived, he went out with Jehoram against Jehu, the son of Nimshi, whom the Lord had appointed to cut off the house of Ahab. And it, uh, it happened when Jehu was executing judgment on the house of Ahab and found the princes of Judah and the sons of Ahaziah's brother who served Ahaziah that he killed them. Then he searched for Ahaziah and they caught him. He was hiding in Samaria and brought him to Jehu. When they had killed him, they buried him because they said he is the son of Jehoshaphat who sought the Lord with, his, with all his heart. So even his association with Jehoshaphat got him a burial at least. The house of Ahaziah had no one to assume power over the kingdom. Now, when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose, this goes from bad to worse, and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada, the priest, for she was a sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Wow, what a legacy, what a story. As you look back, it can look very foggy and murky, and you say, what in the world just happened? Because when I look at the reign of King Jehoshaphat, and I'm going to just briefly review what I shared with you last week. When I look at his reign, I see that his character and, and, and it was, was amazing, and he made some very wholesome decisions. So why would his legacy look like this in his children and grandchildren? Why would this happen? 
So let's just read about, uh, let's just go down a couple of points here about Jehoshaphat. If we, if we were look in 2 Chronicles 17, 19, and 20, and we're not going to read those necessarily, but they show us the character and the accomplishments and the glowing reports of, of Jehoshaphat. And it says that the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David. He did not seek the Baals. He sought the God of his father and walked according to his commandments, not according to the acts of Israel. The Lord established the kingdom in his hand. All Judah gave presents to Jehoshaphat. He had riches and honor in abundance. His heart took delight in the ways of the Lord. These are descriptions of this man who now has this incredible chaos following him. He removed the high places and wooden images from Judah. He sent his leaders to teach in the cities of Judah, and they taught the book of the law throughout all the cities of Judah. The fear of the Lord fell on all the kingdoms around Judah, so they did not make war against Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat became increasingly powerful. He built fortresses and storage cities. He had much property. He had the men of war and the mighty men of valor that were with him in Jerusalem. Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance. He taught the law of God and established judges, a, a, an amazing judicial system in Judah. And he cried out to God for help and led the nation of Judah in depending on God in the midst of a foreign invasion and saw great victory. Those were his accomplishments. But you know, none of us is without fault. And at times, there are things that follow us, our weaknesses. Hebrews talks about the sin that so easily besets us, and I think Jehoshaphat had one of those, or maybe several, but at least a very glaring one. First of all, he made alliances with three wicked kings of Israel. In 2 Chronicles 18, we read, 18 verse 1, we read that Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance, and by marriage he allied himself with Ahab. By marriage. And in the passages that I read at the beginning of this, you're going to find out what that marriage did to his descendants. First of all, by marriage, this was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. Her name was Athaliah, and Jehoshaphat welcomes her into his home as a way of making a partnership, an agreement with an evil king, Ahab. And then he made an alliance with Ahab's son. After Ahab's death, he made an alliance with Ahab's son, Ahaziah. And together they joined a venture to build ships. We read about that in 2 Chronicles 20, 30 to 35 to 37. And because of the wickedness of Ahaziah, the ships never set sail. They were all destroyed in shipwreck. And then, after Ahaziah died, Jehoshaphat makes an alliance with Jehoram, Ahaziah's brother, and went to war with him in 2 Kings 3. I would say that these alliances with the world, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity against God? That's what we read in the New Testament. But here we see him striving hard to try to somehow reconcile with Israel. And I believe there's times that we have situations, I touched on this briefly the last time I preached on this, but where we have something, an organization that splits. And in the nation of Israel, they had split. Ten northern tribes from the two southern tribes of, of Judah and Benjamin. And these kings, it seemed like, wanted to try to unite this. But God had actually split the nation of Israel. And I wonder at times if, if we don't try to Maybe even in our church separations, don't try to reconcile things that God has ordained to be going in different directions. Now, you're going to say, wait a minute, John, what are you trying to say? No, I'm not advocating for church splits. I'm not advocating for those things. 
But there are times, as in the nation of Israel, when there was a separation that was designed and ordained by God, and they were not to bring this together until God did. I'll let you chew on that one. That's not the message for today. But as you look at that, he made these alliances. And you can say, well, why did he do that? I would believe that one of the besetting sins and weaknesses of Jehoshaphat was a thing called a lack of discernment. Not being able to properly discriminate and judge what relationships were sound and where God wanted him to connect and where he didn't. And Jehoshaphat seemed to make these partnerships without consulting God. And we're going to see a little later that Jehoshaphat was warned after every one of these partnerships. And we don't read that Jehoshaphat repented of those partnerships which I believe is very important for his legacy. There are times we make mistakes. There are times that we will fail in life. There are times that we will do the wrong things. We're human. And when we're called back to God and when we are warned by God, we need to repent and forsake those things that we have done wrong. And in this case, I see that the work of Jehoshaphat was to come back. He would receive a warning and he just threw himself into a better performance. When he was warned about his alliance with Ahab, he came home and threw himself into doing reforms in Judah. But we don't read that he repented of that alliance. And I believe that even in our culture, many times coming from plain areas and plain plain cultures, we tend to, if we are find out that we're doing something that is wrong or somebody says something, Instead of repenting, we try to work harder. And when we try to work harder, we put pressure on our families. We put pressure on our communities because of the hypocrisy that is going on. And we try to overcome our failings by our doings. When we should repent of the failings and cut off the connections that come with those failings. But we often miss that point. We just simply try to do better and hopefully outweigh the scales. So he was lacking in repentance. In 2 Chronicles 19, 1 to 3, this is when he comes back from his alliance with Ahab. Ahab had died in battle, and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem, 19 verse 1. And Jehu, the son of Hanani, the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, in that you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek God. So we don't read Jehoshaphat's response other than that he dwelled at Jerusalem and then he went out again among the people and taught them the law of the Lord. But his alliance with Ahab still stood. And Ahab's daughter is in his household as his daughter-in-law. In 2 Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat had received a great victory from the Lord. But at the end of 2 Chronicles 20, we read in verse 35... After this, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, allied himself with Ahaziah, king of Israel, who acted very wickedly. And he allied himself with him to make ships to go to Tarshish. And they made the ships at Ezion Geber. But Eleazar, the son of Dodava of Marisha, prophesied against Jehoshaphat, saying, Because you have allied yourself with Ahaziah, the Lord has destroyed your works. Then the ships were wrecked so that they were not able to go to Tarshish. Because you have allied yourself with evil, your works are destroyed. It, these partnerships had a, a devastating effect on the legacy of Jehoshaphat. And it should have been a warning. This was the second warning he received. And it should have been a warning to him that was very visual that because you have allied yourself with evil, your works will be destroyed. But what does he do? 
Ahaziah dies and there, he doesn't have a son, so his brother, another son of Ahab, becomes king. And we read about this in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 3. The whole chapter is kind of devoted to where Ahab's second son, uh, Jehoram, asks Jehoshaphat to come with him to battle. And Jehoshaphat says, well, I am as you are, my people as your people, and my horses as your horses. And away they go, and they get stranded in the desert. And suddenly Jehoshaphat says, we got to get out of this. And he says, isn't there a prophet of the Lord around here? And they go to Elisha. And here is the third warning that, he, that Jehoshaphat should have heeded. Then Elisha said to the king of Israel, this is 2 Kings 3, 13 to 14, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And notice what Elisha says, verse 14. Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, I would not look at you nor see you. Now, it sounds like a compliment to Jehoshaphat, but it's not. It's a rebuke. He's basically telling Jehoshaphat, you ought to know better. In fact, I wouldn't even have anything to do with this king. But because you're here, I'll speak to you. What he's doing is saying, Jehoshaphat, you shouldn't have anything to do with him either. Three times, three alliances. Why? Because of a lack of... Of discernment. And I want to talk to you about discernment this morning because this is something that I believe is lacking today. The, the need for discernment is very strong, and yet we have so many people who miss discerning the times, miss discerning the seasons, miss discerning the partnerships and the attachments that we get involved in. Our motives for partnerships may be one of the greatest indicators of the nature of that partnership. Why do we get involved? Why do we connect with people? What is going on? Jehoshaphat was an interesting man. He had such a heart for the things of God, yet he lacked discernment. In relationships, he tended to trust the wrong people. Ever find yourself doing that? Man, I just thought they were so, they, they just checked all the boxes. They, they were so enthusiastic. They, they just seemed to say everything right, and I thought I could trust them. Well, are there clues? What could Jehoshaphat have done differently? Well, one of the things that I see happen with Jehoshaphat is that he tended to commit himself to a relationship without consulting God. And then when that relationship demanded some sort of action, that was when he said, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we ought to ask God about this, which is a good thing, but it's a little late because he had already obligated himself to these people. He had already committed to their safety, to their interest, to their well-being, it would have been much better for discernment had he consulted the Lord before making that agreement. That's one of the things we can learn about discernment. How, how do you come to agreement? Do you take the time? I mean, you know, as, as youngsters, we, we connect with a lot of people, and it's at, at in the teenage years, some of those connections can have devastating impacts, but many times they are, are, are fairly minor. But as we get older and we make more solid decisions, those partnerships are very, very key. Whether it's a life partner, whether it's a business partner, whether it's a church agreement or partnership, they're all very important. What's really interesting to note to me, too, is that these agreements that Jehoshaphat entered into were always one-sided. When Jehoshaphat had a whole invasion force coming against him, you don't see the kings of Israel coming to help him. But whenever they had a battle to face, they asked for his help. So Jehoshaphat was not only making unwise partnerships with evil people, he was making unbalanced partnerships where all the giving came from him and there was no benefit. And you say, well, John, isn't that what people of God are supposed to do? Yes, but with wisdom, with understanding, and with discernment. Well, what should we or could we learn from the example of Jehoshaphat when it comes to discernment? Am I like 
Jehoshaphat. Ask yourself that. What kind of agreements am I in? What kind of friendships are, are in my line of, are, are my sphere of influence? What, what people am I obligated to? Who have I tied myself to? Are their values like mine? Do they, do they love the Lord? Do they desire to go the same direction as me? Are, are they, do they have the same vision? And you say, well, John, what does that matter? We should be able to be friends with everybody. Yes, friends, but I'm talking about people whom you've obligated yourself to. People that have a right to require something of you. People that are expecting and depending on you. Over the years, I've seen people latch on quickly to relationships and partnerships in ministry only to be disappointed greatly by the person whom they welcomed. I remember one organization I worked with uh, in the past who I was always amazed from one year to the next, I would see them develop a partnership that I had not heard of the previous year and it was just strong, never seen anything like it. By the next year, that partnership was gone and they were false doctrine or something. They, they, it was amazing how often they would latch onto and let go of. And, and I'm, I'm saying, what is going on? Is there no discernment in the process? How can I be so united in heart one year and the next year be so out of unity? These are things that lack discernment. These are situations in which these were developed but could not continue. Thank God they could at least separate. But discernment is key. And when you make unhealthy, ungodly alliances with people without using discernment, there is a problem. And it will result in death of your vision, death of your organization. It will definitely result in the death of a relationship. Perhaps you've done this. The person seems so authentic, so genuine, so on the face of things, you, you would think it's a match made in heaven. But as the fine print shows up in the relationship, you realize it's actually maybe a, a match designed in a less pleasant place. I mean, some people, the deal, they, 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 to make it seem even sweeter, they say just the things you've been looking for. You know, sometimes the only way out of those is painful or awkward. At best, they're embarrassing situations. At worst, or at the worst, it brings destruction to your life, your organization, or your vision. But Jehoshaphat seemed predisposed to this type of impulsive behavior with the kings of Israel specifically. It's almost as if he felt he was driven to it, like he had no choice but to just simply, they're my brothers. I've got to do this. But there was a choice, and he was rebuked three times for his lack of discernment. And there are times that we make decisions based on the expediency of the moment when we think, I just have to do something. I just, I, if I don't partner with somebody, I'm done. And I grab the first available person to do it. We often make a decision based on a sense of expediency rather than by faith based on obedience to the direction of God. And I believe Jehoshaphat was in some of those areas. Well, discernment, do you have it? Do I have it? What does it take to be discerning? You know, when we sit down to counsel with people, it requires a great deal of discernment. We can't just look at a person and say, well, that, they, they remind me of somebody I counseled once and this must be their problem. No, you have to sit down and listen. You have to listen to the things that aren't even visible at times. When I meet people, or one of the things that I do when I go to another church is I like to walk in and I close my eyes. I don't look. I want to sense. I want to hear what is happening spiritually. When I go to a place that I've never been before, sometimes it's helpful for me to, to close my eyes so that I don't see and, and become misled by the things that look right, but to sense what God is doing. Now, I don't walk into walls or anything like that. I find an appropriate place to sit with my eyes closed, but I try to hear with the Spirit what is going on because I believe that my discernment has often been thrown off by what I see. Some people may feel something about a person or a situation, whether it's good or bad, and make a decision based on their impression. But is that discernment? 
Discernment is more than just a feeling, although feelings and impressions do play a part in discernment. And discernment is definitely more than just checking all my boxes. How many young ladies or young men have said, boy, she checked all the boxes, he checked all the boxes, only to figure out that after they're married, there was a few boxes they should have added that weren't in all the boxes. You see, checking all the boxes may not mean that you have the right boxes to be checked. Discernment also knows which boxes are valid based on principle and context. Sometimes a relationship or situation may feel appropriate based on a temporary need for relief or support. And this is where I've seen many churches and organizations fail. We need a warm body to fill this committee position. We need a warm body to be in this spot. And so we grab the first available one. That's not ideal. But the expediency of the moment makes them seem like the answer to our prayers. And I remember uh, listening, to, our daughters love to uh, listen to Adventures in Odyssey from Focus on the Family. It was their radio program and, um, with the stories. And I remember one of the characters in one of the episodes speaking to another character. This character had just mentioned that a person was the answer or may be the answer to her prayers. And Mr. Walton said, if, if he's the answer to your prayers, I don't even want to know what you've been praying. You know, sometimes we think they're the answer to our prayers, right? We want to know. We, we just, oh, they feel, I, this is, I, I've, and then it's so disappointing, isn't it? The Bible speaks about discernment. And the various words translated discernment or a variant of discernment in the Hebrew and Greek scriptures speak to the following qualities, okay? In Hebrew, a lot of times when the word discern is used, it is, it is meaning to judge, to separate, or to discriminate. And we don't like the word discrimination, do we? This days, when you hear somebody is discriminating, it sounds terrible. But do you realize that we all, by definition, discriminate? Everybody that walked in here this morning fully clothed and hopefully in their right mind discriminated about what clothing they were going to put on. They eliminated some and they chose others. That's a simple discrimination. I, I knew what I wanted to look like when I came in here. It may not have nailed it, but I certainly used that vision of what I would look like to pick my clothing and I discriminated against what wouldn't help me to look this way and I came dressed the way I am because I discriminated. Discrimination gets a bad rap today because we think that, well, it excludes people. Well, every employer, when they hire, have a basis of judging, right? Does the person have aptitude for the job? Can he grow into this? Can she grow into this? Do they have skills already? Do they not have skills? Do they have a good Ability to work with people, or are they better stuck in a back room doing some sorting or something? We, we, that's discrimination. You're making a judgment call. You're looking at the qualities that are needed for a particular task, and you make a, a call. So every employer, even though they have their non-discrimination clauses, discriminates. If you don't believe that there's discrimination, just go to a healthcare provider and see, or, or your insurance agent and see if you qualify for something. They're gonna tell you yes or no, depending on what? Characteristics that fit the bill. And if you don't have those characteristics, they discriminate against you and say, no, you may not have the coverage for this at this time. And it's, it's all part and parcel of life. So when somebody gets all bent out of shape about discriminating, just let them know we all do that. And, um, and there, there is something about that. So discernment involves discriminating. And you're gonna say, boy, that doesn't sound good, John. Well, just take it for what it's worth. There is a true definition of discrimination, not just what wokeism would tell us is discrimination. In fact, if you wanna be technical, wokeism and, and the woke crowd discriminate highly against whatever doesn't fit their categories. It's just what they consider valid discrimination. You know what I'm saying? I, and I'm not here to poke fingers. I'm just saying, just get, get the perspective. And so discernment means you're going to need to use some sort of judgment to separate and sort through 
Anytime you sort through something, even the stuff you're going to take to goodwill or whatever, you're discriminating. I'm going to keep these clothes. I'm going to send those. I don't want those anymore. It's, it's a judgment call. Let's take, the, let's take some of the, the passion out of a word like discriminate and understand it's basically meaning making a judgment call on something. Um, and in the Greek, it means to learn by discriminating, to determine, to decide. There's another word that means to test, to prove, to scrutinize. Um, I could try to tell you what those words were and, and pronounce them for you, but you probably wouldn't look them up anyway, so I'll just tell you the definitions. Uh, uh, then there's the other one that means a distinguishing, a clear discrimination, discerning, judging. And these are all pertaining to either perceive or discern um, in their translation. And that which means, which relates to judging, fit for a skilled, fit for or skilled in judging. So discernment also suggests the ability to recognize what is going on. In Matthew 16, 3, Jesus spoke to the people and he reproved them for being able to look at the sky and discern the type of weather that was coming, but they couldn't look around them and discern the season of salvation. They weren't able to recognize it. So true discernment has a greater degree of diagnosis than a few catch-all labels. Now, we like to label things, and we think that helps us to make good choices. And if you talk to most couples today that are having struggles in marriage, they have two major bins that are sitting in their lives. But you couldn't guess what those two bins are. Women who have a problem with their husbands usually throw all of their negative behavior into a bin called narcissism. Men tend to throw all of the negative behavior of their wives into a bin called what? Jezebel. And um, those are large categories. And we have this kind of thing that we, we kind of just, and it's not discernment. True discernment would get to the heart of some matters, but it's labeling. And labeling can go to other things. You can say you're a bigot, you're Today, it's you're a bigot, you're sexist, you're racist, you're all of these things, and we have labels that don't help us to discern anything. They just create an emotional reaction. And when you label things, you're not necessarily being discerning. You're trying to create emotion. And so I would encourage you, if you're going to use labels, let's do better than just get a big bin. Maybe we need a few pigeonholes. And I know we don't like to pigeonhole anything either, but... As Mennonites, we're very good at pigeonholing which church everybody fits into. Let's not do that, but let's start looking at this and say, can we discern? When I moved to, to Saskatchewan, I had, a real I had a real problem. Didn't realize how much sight impacted my impression of people. But when I moved to Saskatchewan, I realized I could not pigeonhole people by the way they dressed. They looked like anybody, they, they, there was very few of them. There were a couple that were definite, had a costume, but the rest of them, you wouldn't know if you met them in Walmart what church they went to. But when you showed up in church, some of them were so conservative they wouldn't have a guitar in church. Some of them still knelt for prayer, um, silent prayer, in fact, during the service. But they looked like any John or Jane Doe out there. I, I couldn't figure that out. It was, and I realized how much my eyes had been geared to sight to gauge people rather than discerning what was going on inside. And friends, we need to stop looking at the outward and start listening to the inward if we're going to make a proper discernment. It's important. It's important. If you ever want to know how much you're geared to sight... Just move to a community that doesn't have Amish and Mennonite background and tell me how well you fare in pegging the church people. You'll suddenly realize that your eyes have been glazed over with all the shades of costumes that people wear for church. Strange, isn't it? How are you at discerning? While labels may be helpful, they're not necessarily discernment. They are labels and become increasingly large bins into which we throw any undesirable qualities or actions. These labels are generally applied after a person is in a relationship, not before. <laughs> That's when we realize how big of a garbage bin should be outside that person's door. 
Human beings have a sin nature that is selfish, proud, and opposed to God. This nature is revealed in our interactions with each other in life. Without the grace of God, each of us has a potential for any number of negative labels. And these labels may even be correct, but simply labeling someone or having several categories of bins does not make you a discerning person. True discernment is based on truth. And if you're unwilling to acknowledge the truth about yourself and your motives, you're going to have a very difficult time discerning the character and motives of others. I can't overstate that. I have a lot of people that come to me and they tell me things like, I can smell religious, religious abuse a mile away. I'm saying, well, how can you smell it a mile away? Well, I went through some and I know how it felt. So when I feel that, no, that, that's, you have a memory of pain. And if that pain is trampled on, you might label it something because it feels like the same pain you experienced when you encountered what you term whatever it is. But a recognition of pain is not the same thing as recognition of substance. Understand that. And when you try to go through life making discernments based on a, a reaction to pain that you feel, you're going to find yourself veering into some very damaging situations. Stop trying to make decisions by a reaction of pain. And you say, well, how can I do that? Well, that's another topic that talks about First of all, recognizing the truth and then finding freedom for your life in those things. But I will just say this this morning as a warning. Reactions to pain is not necessarily discernment. It's a reaction to pain. And it's a, it's a valid reaction perhaps, but it's not going to make you wise. It will simply make you run. Psalm 51, verse 6 says, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Discernment is necessary in every area of life, not the least in the area of media. And the paradigm of news and social media these days is not primarily to inform, but rather to influence. The reporting is not so that the reader knows primarily, but that the reader does something that the reporter considers necessary. All right? So the paradigm that our news and our media comes to us is not so much that we know, but that we do. And I think it's important when you consume media, whether it's the, the mainstream media or social media or these private posts that seem to have the inside scoop on everything, listen for a couple of things. Usually... They give you some fragments of information, and then they give you some commentary on how you should act on that information. You see, their primary desire is to influence. Why do you think social media people are called influencers? Everybody wants to influence. Everybody wants to change the world, but very few people want to actually contribute to making the world a better place. We just want to move other people to do those things. So beware of that. Use discernment in what you take in. So, are there some biblical examples of discernment? Well, let's look at this. King Solomon, in 1 Kings 3, verse 9, King Solomon prayed for discernment. He said, Therefore give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? Now Solomon could have said, I've got dad's example for, our dad's, dad's whole history for an example, but he says, look, I'm young. God, would you give me a discerning heart? Pray for discernment. Isaiah tells us this about Messiah, who would exercise discernment. Isaiah 11, 3 to 4a. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by what? The sight of his eyes or by the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the poor. That's the spirit that God wants to give us as well. The things of God require discernment. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually what? Discerned. You need 
that spirit of God to accurately discern what is going on. And friends, we, we believe here firmly in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Without it, we are nothing. Without it, we don't have the mind of Christ, per se. We need Him, by His Spirit, moving through us in glorious fashion to alert us, to, to lead us, to guide us, to, to put a check there when we're going the wrong way, to when we're wanting to make a decision that is wrong or a partnership that is wrong. He puts that check in our spirit and says, not this way, but this is the way, walk in it. We need that. Spiritual maturity depends on it. Hebrews 5.14 says, But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of, their, of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Maturity depends on discernment. Well, we could look at a number of other things. I'm going to skip down through here. Um, just a few examples in, in the Old Testament and in the New. The Shunammite woman recognized Elisha. How? In, the, in, the, in 2 Kings 4, verse 9, she said to her husband, Look, I know, the King James says, perceive that this is a holy man of God who passes by us regularly. How did she know that? Something in his spirit bore witness with her spirit, but she discerned that this was a man of God. And as Pastor Burnell so eloquently shared with us a, a couple of weeks ago, she built a room. She built a room on her house that became a room that housed blessing. But it began with discernment, understanding who was coming by her place regularly. Nehemiah needed discernment to perceive motives. Nehemiah 6, 12. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he had pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. You can go to read that in Nehemiah, but it's an interesting story where he gets this prophecy that is saying, come, let's go into the temple, let's hide because somebody wants to get you. And he says, no, I'm not going to do that. And then he says, I discerned or perceived. Jesus used discernment when he perceived the thoughts of people, Luke 5, When Jesus perceived their thoughts... He answered and said to them, why are you reasoning in your thoughts, in your hearts, I'm sorry. And Peter realized his prejudices when he perceived God's will in Acts 10, 34. He went to speak to Gentiles. And Peter opened his mouth and said, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But discernment exposed Peter's prejudices. And discernment will expose ours too. That's why when we want to make judgments on others, it needs to be done in truth. It needs to be done in truth. If I am harboring lack of discernment about my own weaknesses, I'm going to have a hard time accurately assessing other people. If I'm insecure in my own walk with God, I'm going to have a hard time accurately discerning the walk of God for others. And there are many people that because they're insecure, when they see God do something in another's life that they haven't seen done in their lives, they become jealous or envious. And they may even want to try to detract from that. Be careful. God desires truth in the inward parts. Okay, enough about discernment. I could say a lot more, but I think we're going to move on to the heirs of the king. And that is Jehoram and Ahaziah. So the heirs of Jehoshaphat, we read that Je Jehoram was influenced by his wife to kill his own brothers and other political rivals. Probably one of the longest and most devastating reaches as a result of Jehoshaphat's unwise alliance with Ahab shows up in this section of scripture. We see Athaliah influencing the son of Jehoshaphat to grave heirs. If Jehoshaphat would have had discernment in his alliances, perhaps this could have been avoided. But what we are going to see is that this woman that he married to his son and brings into his household begins to undermine all of the good that Jehoshaphat was doing. And there's many times when you will see yourself working so hard to get something done and there is something that you have allowed into your home or your life by agreement that is taking out, taking you out at the knees. It's just cutting your feet right off from under you and there's no progress. And as we see this happening to Jehoram, 
I mean, what, a, what an insidious thing, but kills all of his brothers and the princes of Judah. So it narrows down the gene pool pretty quick. All of a sudden, it's just Jehoram and his descendants. Should anything happen to him, who takes over? But he was influenced by Ahab's daughter. And verse 6 of 2 Chronicles 21 says, He followed the wicked example of King Ahab and the other kings of Israel because he had married one of Ahab's daughters. And that connection brought him under the wrath that God had pronounced on Ahab's family. The judgment that God had pronounced on Ahab's family. Now there would have been a place, I believe, for repentance, for a change, but there wasn't that. And they continued in the ways of Ahab's family. Here we can clearly see the influence of Jehoshaphat's alliance with Ahab on Jehoshaphat's family and kingdom. By making an alliance with the enemies of the Lord, Jehoshaphat brought an evil influence into his home that ended up touching all of his family and all of his kingdom. And it's interesting to note that Jehoram's evil tendencies are tied in Scripture to the negative and evil influence of his wife, who was Ahab's daughter. Now, men, don't think that I'm telling you that all of the influences in your life that are going bad right now are because of your wife. I'm not saying that. I'm saying in this case. All right? There might be some of you who are tempted to say, yep, I can see that. I, I know what, what she's like. Well, he was no piece of cake either. Nobody wanted to be around him. In fact, when he died... He passed on to no one's regret. So just remember that in case you're wanting to point fingers at each other. Our choices have eternal consequences. They are not just for today, although we may think that they are. Perhaps if you and I could follow the trial, the trail of our choices we make today, we would be shocked to see how far they reach into the future. Look back. Can you see when choices you made years ago are still impacting your life today? I've said this, when I met Karen, my whole life changed. All of the relationships and everything, it's not that I had any major separation. It was just that at that season in life, when I met her, God did, did some things in my life, and it took me on a whole different trajectory. In fact, many people that I interacted with before I met her, and it wasn't because of her necessarily, but that whole relationship changed. And they do. It, it is, my relationship with my wife has impacted my life. That's a choice, that's a, a decision that has made all the difference. And it's been such a positive thing. And I am so grateful for what God brought. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor of the Lord. These are important things, but you can look at other choices that you've made. Not all choices have as clear an impact or a change of events attached to them. Many are simply part of a myriad of decisions that function as maintenance of your existence. But they all do play a part in the future. Relationships, friends, are doorways as well as pathways that lead somewhere. Remember that. Relationships are doorways as well as pathways that lead somewhere. They impact your life. Choose well with whom you will align yourself. Well, then we get down to Ahaziah. Ahaziah in 2 Chronicles 22, 1 to 4, we read some things about him. Um, in 22, 3, this is what we read. He also walked in the ways of the house of Ahab, for his mother advised him to do wickedly. So she first advised her husband, now she advises her son, and both of them follow. Both of them follow her example. And he did very wickedly. And he didn't live long. So in, less, or in about 10 years after Jehoshaphat had died, his son, actually all his sons, and his grandson are dead. That's why the next heir to the throne is Athaliah, the daughter-in-law who orchestrated the whole destruction. And since there were no heirs of her son, no, no children of her son that were powerful enough to take the throne, she kills the rest of them and takes the throne. This, this is a mere 10 years after this mighty king who had wealth and honor and riches in abundance. What a legacy. And it was because of a fatal decision 
and a lack of discernment that brought this about. Where are your decisions leading you today? What are the partnerships that you are forming? Where are they taking you? Because relationships are doorways and pathways that lead somewhere. Because in these few short years, this powerful kingdom has been reduced to one heir that Athaliah didn't even know existed. One insignificant chap. Let me read the description of Athaliah again. Second Chronicles 22, 10 to 12. Now when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she rose and destroyed all the royal heirs of the house of Judah. But Jehoshabeth, the daughter of the king, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered and put him and his nurse in a bedroom. So Jehoshabeth, the daughter of King Jehoram, the wife of Jehoiada the priest, for she was the sister of Ahaziah, hid him from Athaliah so that she did not kill him. And he was hidden with them in the house of God for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. So she had a six-year reign. And then we read about Joash. In the seventh year, 23 verse 1, in the seventh year, Joash strengthened him, Jehoiada strengthened himself and made a covenant with the captains of hundreds. Azariah, the son of Jeroham, Ishmael, the son of Jehohanan, Azariah, the son of Obed, Maaseah, the son of Adea, and Elishaphat, the son of Zikri. And they went throughout Judah and gathered the Levites from all the cities of Judah and the chief fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. Then, they all, then all the assembly made a covenant with the king in the house of God, and he said to them, Behold, the king's son shall reign as the Lord has said of the sons of David. As I was meditating, and the worship team, if you want to prepare, uh, it's about 10 minutes. As I was meditating on the legacy of Jeho Jehoshaphat, how could a good man have such a dismal legacy? And as I pondered the story of the legacy, brought on by a lack of discernment and by a besetting sin, it dawned on me that there is still a ray of light to the story. And perhaps the story isn't, the legacy isn't totally dependent on a man. And as I pondered this, I wrote, all the royal heirs to the throne of David have been slain. Athaliah, daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, sits on the throne of Judah, and it seems that all is lost. But something is stirring. Something is going on in the house of God. Hidden from the eyes of the world. I wrote this in, in uh, 2020. Hidden from the eyes of the world inside the temple of God, God's plan is unfolding and taking shape. We have a young boy who is rescued from death and he's learning about life. An unknown child and newly born, yet his destiny is to lead God's people. In the house of God, he is nourished and brought up to be a king. And for six years, as evil goes unchecked on the streets, this young child is growing where? In the house of God, right next door to the palace. Something is stirring in the house of God that is going to bring a change in this situation. Darkness has covered the nation, and people groan under the oppression. But who will deliver them, and how? And as I was writing, what I wrote turned into a poem. And this is what I wrote. Something stirring in the house of God. A king is being grown. Though all around confusion reigns, God's plan will soon be known. While all seems lost, and dead, despairing, a light is dawning, hearts repairing. There in God's house where priests are caring, God's chosen king has been preparing. 
And that poem was a seed for a song that I continued writing. In fact, I thought at one point this was a throwaway verse that was never going to see the light of day until this morning at between 4 and 5 when I was wrapping up this sermon. I said, you know what, I think I need to read that this morning because the legacy that happened to Jehoshaphat was not just seen in his mistakes. Jehoshaphat, remember I told you, went throughout the land of Judah restoring and teaching the people about God. He laid in place a judicial system. He strengthened the priesthood. He brought the nation to the law of God and he settled them firmly on that. And I believe that had he not done that, perhaps there wouldn't have been a Jehoiada. Perhaps there wouldn't have been a Jehoshabeth who took this risk. Perhaps there wouldn't have been a will in the rest of the people when an option was given them to come together and make this child king. You see, there's the other aspect of legacy that God, I believe, worked with. There were some consequences that came from a legacy of bad alliances, but God worked with the other. And the legacy of Jehoshaphat is is not that it nearly went out, but that a light remained. And friends, there are many of us today who struggle. We look around, we say, everything going on in my life is falling apart. Everything is, is, is going to pieces. And I don't think I have a legacy. I don't think there is any good that can come of this. But can I tell you that we have a God in heaven and something is stirring in his house. Something is stirring in his plans and he is able to take what has fallen apart and redeem it for his glory. And I don't know what your life is looking like today, but I want to tell you that God is a redeemer and your legacy need not be your failure, but it can be the redemption that God brings by taking those things that were sown into his kingdom and bringing them to light. In this case, I believe the redeemer used the good things that Jehoshaphat had done and overcame evil with good. It was because of God, but something was stirring in his house. Something was changing in there that brought about this this change of pace. And so, 2 Chronicles 23, 20 to 21. He took the captains of the hundreds, the nobles, the governors of the people, and all the people of the land and brought the king down from the house of the Lord And they went through the upper gate to the king's house and set the king on the throne of the kingdom. Verse 21, so all the people of the land rejoiced and the city was quiet for they had slain Athaliah with the sword. And perhaps that's the true legacy of Jehoshaphat. Through his failures, we can gain insight into our own failings. We can take caution from the disastrous results of his worldly partnerships. We can still repent of our failings. Jehoshaphat, I believe, failed to repent of his, but we can still still repent and pray for strength to do what is right. We can still take hope in the fact that even today, things are not only stirring, but are actively thundering in the house of God on our behalf. God is still our Redeemer, He is still moving, He still convicts. He still reproves. He still redeems our lives from destruction. And he crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. Our world looks dark and grim today, but something's stirring in the house of God. Don't ever forget it. Our God is alive. His plans continue to unfold. Friends, Let's confess our faults to one another. Let's pray for each other that we may be healed. None of us is immune to the influences of the day. But as we fulfill the biblical mandate to pray for one another, confessing our faults, we can be healed. Those things that seem like they're falling apart and the legacy that you're saying, oh man, I don't know how to change that. Heed the word of the prophets. Heed the word of the apostles. Repent, forsake those things that have laid a foundation for disaster and build for life. 
You see, the legacy of a king, as we read scripture, is that light overcame darkness and all the land had peace. Because what had been brought in by a bad agreement has now been dealt with and peace can come. And there may be things in our lives that need to be dealt with so that peace can come. And I just want to tell you that today is the day to deal with it. Today is the day to open your heart to the Lord and invite his presence, invite his candle to search your heart and, and really to, to deal with those things that you have allowed in that are, are, are laying a foundation for destruction. This is, this is not a time to sit back and say, well, I wonder how that's going to turn out. No, today is a day to step into the house of God, not only to allow it to stir there, but allow it to stir your heart. Many of us have walked a road that leads to a legacy of destruction. But heed the warnings of the word. Repent of sin. Turn to God. Allow him to redeem and shape your legacy. For some of you, that may mean I need to talk with my children. For some of you, that may mean I need to talk with my wife. For some, of them, for some of you, that may mean I just need to talk to somebody and confess to them what's been going on so that they can pray for me and that the prayer of faith will save and heal. Whatever God is leading you to today, don't allow the enemy to lie to you and say, you've laid the bed, you've made the bed, now you're going to sleep in it. No, let God upset that bed that you've made for yourself. You just tell him I've made it wrong. And I want to repent of that. I want to come back to your plan. God bless, worship team.
girls, it would be nice if we'd sing some more so you can do that, right? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother John. A lot of, I've done a lot of diligence in, oh, I didn't see, I thought I was on. Did a lot of diligence in studying in that message. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful message. There are some things, you know, John, I hate to speak after a message. <laughs> no, I hate it. I don't like it. It's like, what should I say? It's like, let's just dismiss. No, we don't want to just do that either. So it's always difficult. Everyone finds it difficult. But let me, I was, I was sitting back there. It's like, Lord, what should I say a little bit at the end here? So here's one thing. We, we, we live in a day when we need more discernment than we have ever had, really. Really. Because there are seemingly, there are many, many ways. There's a lot of different things that are out there. I mean, at one time, I think Adam and Eve had basically a choice to eat and not eat. Today, there is many different things that can lead you to many different ways. And what is interesting, it is the decisions we make that look ever so small at times will take us in some of the greatest distance, whether it's good or bad. And my thing was, Lord, what would be a word that I could confirm to you all concerning discernment? And I think it's this. In my observation down through my life, I have spoken much about the discerning of spirits being a spiritual gift that comes from the Holy Spirit. And then we need common discernment, whether it's on a job, whether it's on how fast you drive, whether you want to pass someone and you see traffic ahead and you got to pass because the person's going too slow. There's just discernment is something we really learn to live with. But when does it come from the Holy Spirit? And this is what I want to leave with you. When is it the Holy Spirit that is kicking in, if I could call it that way, and giving you discernment? It's this. When He shows you the final destiny of that decision. Something I've learned. Many times you have, you think, oh, oh, I think maybe if I turn left or right here, okay. But when the Holy Spirit, when it's the gift of the Holy Spirit, that gives you and shows you discernment. He shows you the ultimate place where this is heading. Then you can know that's the gift of the Holy Spirit in you. And you'd better take heed for that. Other things are things you can make mistakes in. But when you see the ultimate picture, because only the Holy Spirit knows that. He discerns and he can see way out in the distance because that's what he does, according to the Bible. He's, he can go into places where nothing else can. So if you want to know how much of the Holy Spirit's discernment you have, keep looking that one. Keep, keep looking at that one in your heart. Amen? In making your decisions. I tremble. Um, and I thank you, John. The way you closed yet at the end is offering that hope. And I always, I love that. Um, we make decisions in life. Every one of you has made a decision before you came today. But so we make decisions in life that have lasting effects. Some affect us for a little bit. Others have very, very long lasting effects. And I know that in my life that I've found in, in counseling with people, I've already come to a place where I say, how in the world did you get here? And normally the people will take you back to one little thing that seemed so innocent, and not very big. That's how you got here. And I will say this, most of those things I find in the middle of an unfortunate situation, something very unfortunate happened to you or something. And it's in that unfortunate situation is where the devil is always, almost always has a presence there to turn you and take you completely to the left or right. I found that. And if I can say this, I say that with years of experience knowing what I'm talking about. That is not just a little pop question, that, an answer that came to me. This is something that I have observed. In an unfortunate situation, when something goes wrong, when something is not right, that's often where these little decisions that turn into such huge decisions 
at the end of life, it'll come up. I mean, I've, listen, listen to me for a little bit. I remember in this church many years ago, I, I, I stood here and uh, preaching, not at this building, another building, and I was preaching. And I remember distinctly one moment where I was, where I very clearly felt that there was a person that was rejecting the message that I was preaching. And it had to do with repentance. And I know that when I walked away from that service that day, I thought, hmm, that is somebody that's going the wrong way. And yet everything else looked right. Do you know today that family has a girl that's married to another girl and they bless it. And they're involved in all kinds of witchcraft and approve it. When you look back, it was a moment of offense that turned them wrong. And look, look where it is today. Who would have ever thought that? Decisions. We make them every day. God help us to make right decisions and clear decisions and have the spirit of discernment that the Holy Spirit gives us so we can see the ultimate where it's going. Amen? God bless you. And if we have made wrong decisions, you know, this is our Jesus. This is where we have it over any other religion in the world. And that is, we have a Father that forgives us and brings us back. Amen. Bible says that. The righteous do that. They fall, but they will stand back up. Amen. Now, one final question. This is completely out of context. How many of you were cold today? Raise them high. We want to see it. How many of you were warm today? Okay, we had some warm and we had some cold. Now I want to explain something to you. We put new units in here, and I sat back there in the corner, and I was all of us. I was just cold through and through. So I asked around a little bit, several people, and I got different response. They're trying to figure this out so that we can have more of a uniform heat in here. Um, yeah, it's a new system, and the air conditioning works really, really well. And uh, but there might be some hot spots and cold spots. And ushers, if you would make yourself aware of the, where the hot spots are for the people that are typically cold, they could ask you, could I sit in a warmer spot until we got this thing figured out? One of the things I'm aware of is that there are some fans coming uh, in here to try to make it more pleasant for you all. We don't want you to freeze. All right? Hallelujah. The other remark I want to make Oh, the beauty that I see over here, these men that came up here. You know, you're, you're, God has brought some wonderful people here. And I just want to bless that. I, I, I was, if I can say it this way, maybe you'll take it wrong and never come back. Well, that's up to you. But I felt very proud to stand with these men over here today while they had their little children there worshiping God. Something that, Wow, it is just the clean, the clean cut guys that were there. Um, they have purpose in life. They're going somewhere in life. They're living a good life, a solid life, raising a solid family. And I want to bless you for that. I just really want to bless you for that. All you men and all you women that have a solid home and you're it, yeah, there's problems, there's struggles that you go through. Sure, we understand that. But you're shining in the middle of that. And I want to bless that. May God give you a blessed generation that goes down from children to children to children. Amen. God bless you. God bless you so much. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this moment. Thank you for the message you've delivered to us. The warnings that we have heard the little decisions that do big things, we can be a king like Jehoshaphat was. He was a king. But what is a king when he goes wrong? We can be kings in wrongdoings or we can be children being led by the Spirit of God. I pray, Father, that you would minister this to us. Help us to constantly see and, and be able to see everything in front of us, beside us, and the influences that we get. 
There's a lot of influence in this world to take us down a wrong road, wrong path, to bring us into a place that we wonder how in the world did we ever get here. Deliver us from evil, Lord. Deliver us from these moments and help us to be strong and to repent if we are going in wrong places. If we're doing wrong things, Father, we repent before you and we ask you to forgive us in the name of Jesus. This is who you are. Thank you, Jesus. You're a good God. We love you. Yes, there's times when we thought you've let us down, but you didn't. Sorry for at times not understanding you when things were hard, when things were difficult. But we know that you lead us. Sometimes, yeah, down that valley that looks like death all around us. But in that valley, you restore our soul. We pray that you would, your hand of restoration would go across this audience and restore everything that needs restored. Bring a new beginning wherever it needs new beginning. May your spirit, O oh God, become very strong in all of us, that your name would be glorified. Thank you, Lord. Protect us. There's people that are not here today. Quite a number of them have sickness in their homes. And I just pray, Father, that you would bring healing and people that are here, everywhere that your word is, there is healing. And I pray for that healing influence that comes from heaven, that comes through the provision in Christ. And also people that are traveling abroad in other places, people that will be flying in this, this next week, even some of my own family. I pray, Father, for your protection over them and bring them home safe. Father, we, we bless you. Thank you for everybody that is here today. Thank you for everyone, all the children, all the ones that you brought here, all the ones that don't even know for sure. Thank you, Lord, for bringing them here. We ask your blessing upon them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>